Good evening, Your Excellency, Reverend Fathers, good brothers and sisters, and ladies and gentlemen. This is the first time I have ever attended the Fatima Conference. Last year, I was supposed to give a talk here, but I got sick right before. And uh, this year, I was trying to get sick, <laughs> to get out of it, but unfortunately, I was taking too many vitamins. And and health won out. When the bishop first asked me to give the keynote address, he had called Our Lady of Victory's phone number and left a message. Unfortunately, the entire message was white noise. I heard a few words. I can only make out a few words. And whenever the bishop calls, especially out of the blue, I always get a little nervous that I do something wrong. Does someone complain about me? Is he wanting to send me to Africa or the Middle East? Well, eventually, <clears throat> I got a hold of the bishop, and all he wanted was to, for me to give the keynote address. But I, I must have misunderstood him a little as to what he wanted the talk to be about precisely. My understanding at the time was that he had basically wanted me to speak about Our Lady of Fatima's prophetic words, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. Luckily, or rather providentially, about a month ago, I was set straight by Father Benedict as to what the bishop intended. The bishop wanted this talk to focus on Our Lady's triumphs throughout history and currently, rather than focusing too much on the final triumph. And this set me straight, but definitely upset my train of thought as I was mentally preparing a whole talk to explain those mysterious words of Our Lady, words which I had never given deep consideration before. But I found it very interesting to ponder what Our Lady have could have meant. What is the triumph she was referring to? Are we witnessing that triumph? Are we living through this triumph? Are we in the midst of it? Or has it happened already? Or is it something far more wonderful and miraculous yet to come? You see, the problem with prophecy, however, is that it is open to much interpretation, misunderstanding, pure speculation, and personal opinion. And if my whole talk would have been simply presenting various possible explanations of Our Lady's words, well, it would probably be largely useless and of little help and edification to anyone. So focusing on Our Lady's past triumphs and current triumphs is indeed the wiser course. However, I don't think this talk would be complete without at least discussing that final triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart. And so I'll touch on that topic towards the end. Frankly, I feel inadequate to do any real justice to the topic, except in so far to approach the subject in my own way, in, in a way that I personally feel, find more helpful spiritually. So I would like to approach this topic of the triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart primarily from a dogmatic and spiritual point of view than just merely bits of historical trivia, mere historical examples. However, there are clearly example after example of triumphs of Our Lady throughout history of the Church. Miracles, conversions, apparitions, triumphs over heresies, etc. She is Our Lady of Victory, which happens to be the name of my parish in London. So on this there is no doubt, and I will talk about some of her major triumphs. But let us be quite clear on this. Our hope is in Our Lady's intercession, her goodness towards us, her maternal love towards her spiritual children, her ability to save souls, her power to triumph over the devil and all the enemies of the church, and to put an end to this crisis in the church. Our hope is not founded and should not be founded on any sign or wonder that may have happened throughout history, Fatima included. Our hope must be primarily founded on revelation, on dogmatic truths and traditional Catholic theology regarding Our Lady. And even if she never appeared to any saint or sinner throughout the last 2,000 years, even if she never performed the stupendous miracles that she had performed at Guadalupe and Lourdes and Fatima, our hope should not be any less our Lord warned us against looking for signs and wonders. 
And the danger in these days, and so many well-meaning Catholics have been deceived or misguided by judging and conforming theology and their theological position to an apparition, rather than judging that apparition by traditional Catholic theology and the Catholic magisterium. As I said earlier today, devotion not founded on dogma or solid theology is questionable devotion. And this is particularly true of devotion to Our Lady. So in order to solidify and increase our devotion to Mary, I want to emphasize a few of the most consoling truths of our faith concerning her, from which flow all the manifold relations between her and us. Just as a few close friends are much more important to us, or more influential to ourselves than a thousand mere acquaintances, so a few big ideas possessed and digested and made one's own is far more valuable to us intellectually and spiritually than a thousand little ideas. A thousand bits of trivia, mere facts and figures and information. And these supremely consoling truths that I want to emphasize is that of Mary's motherhood, that she is the mother, not only of Christ, but of his whole mystical body, the whole Christ, head and members. And being the mother of Christ in the natural order, she is the mother of our souls in the supernatural order of divine grace. And she is literally not merely poetically or metaphorically, the mother of the interior life of our soul. And on this is founded our hope in her. On this is founded all her triumphs, past, present, and future. So let us begin at the beginning as a review. Her triumph really began all the way back in the Garden of Eden. After the fall, God said to the serpent, the devil, in the famous verse in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. Now, however, which way we, anyone wants to translate who shall crush the head of Satan, whether it is ipse, ipsa, or ipsum, he, she, it, there's different translations. The due has she, because the Vulgate has ipsa. Either way, it ultimately means the devil will be crushed by the woman either directly or by her seed. And who is the woman? It's Our Lady. Who is her seed? Jesus Christ. So Our Lady is intimately connected with Our Lord's ultimate triumph over Satan. However, it seems to be more in line with Catholic tradition, or rather the sensus catholicus, the Catholic sense that Our Lady herself crushes the head of Satan. And what is interesting and confirms this is the image found on the miraculous medal itself. Now, private revelation is not the source from which we should normally go for theological argument, but it is a significant, a significant that Our Lady herself showed St. Catherine Labore the vision of the medal with an image of herself crushing the serpent. She's done the interpreting for us. This is the classic symbol of the Immaculate Heart of Mary's triumph over Satan. All the mysteries of Our Lady's life, all the privileges and prerogatives which are hers, and all the supernatural influence she exerts, all of them flow from one great truth, that she is the mother of God. She is the mother of Jesus. Jesus is a divine person. Therefore, logically, she is the mother of God. Not the mother of the eternal divine nature, but of a divine person, the second person of the Most Holy Trinity. And every honor or grace that is bestowed upon her is contained in this title. And since we're not able to comprehend the greatness of God, the infinite greatness of God, so we're not able to completely grasp the awesomeness of this unique privilege of the divine motherhood, so that she might be worthy of and perfectly fulfill her role and her mission and her office. God lavished upon her the greatest gifts and privileges of divine grace, raising her to the supreme height of holiness and divine union with him, even from the first moment of her conception. Hail, full of grace, as the archangel Gabriel announced to her. So her holiness, her holiness is greater than 
the holiness of all the angels and the saints combined. As the blazing sun is compared to a little candle flame. St. Bonaventure says that God could make a bigger world or a wider sky, but he could not raise a pure creature higher than Mary, for the dignity of Mother of God is the highest dignity that can be conferred on a creature. She is the chosen daughter of the Eternal Father, the Mother of the Son, the spouse of the Holy Ghost, and therefore God loves her more than all creation put together. And if he had to choose between all of creation and Mary, he would choose her. She is God's jewel, his gem, the apple of his eye, his best friend, his beloved, the woman of his dreams, the mother of his dreams. And only God is able to make his dreams come perfectly true. She is a paradise for God. Her immaculate heart reflects the holiness of the sacred heart of her divine son. Now, Our Lady's role was not to be merely a passive recipient of divine grace, not merely a passive spectator in the great mystery of the redemption. The redemption is the great repair job of the fall, their recreation and grace. The fall is being reversed, as it were. St. Paul called our Lord the new Adam, the new head of, the human, of redeemed humanity, of a new race of men spiritually reborn, if they so chose. And this is why the fathers of the church from the earliest times loved to call Mary the new Eve, because that is what she is in the supernatural order. The fall of the human race came about primarily because the sin of pride and disobedience of Adam as head of the human race, and yet Eve had her part to play in the fall. So in the redemption, Christ redeemed us by his obedience to his father by dying on the cross, but Mary, the new Eve, must have her role as well. Just as Eve's fall was not essential to the fall, not the cause of the fall of the human race, so the new Eve's role in redemption is not essential, not the cause of redemption, not the cause of our salvation, but it was an integral part of the plan of redemption. If Adam hadn't fallen, the human race would not have fallen. The key was Adam. If Christ hadn't suffered and died for us, then we would not have been redeemed. The key was Christ. If Eve hadn't tempted Adam he probably would not have fallen. If Mary would not have consented to be the mother of the Messiah, there would have been no incarnation, no redemption, no hope of salvation, no hope of eternal happiness, no heaven. Think about that. Everything ultimately depended on her saying yes. Be it done unto me according to thy word. That was the triumph that set everything in motion. Every soul saved by our Lord's atoning sacrifice on the cross owes not only a heartfelt thanksgiving to her, but eternal allegiance and the deepest love to her. Imagine if she said no. Imagine if she said no. But her office and role in redemption is not only to be the mother of God, not only, I speak as a fool, not only to be the mother of God, the mother of the Redeemer, the mother of Christ. She was destined to be the mother of God's adopted children in grace, the mother of the redeemed, the mother of the mystical body of Christ. And Christ is the head of the mystical body. But Mary, as many of the fathers of the church teach, is the mystical neck through which all the graces from the head to the members flow. She is the new Eve. And as the new Eve is the mother of all the living, all those who live the life of grace, of sanctifying grace, those who participate in the divine nature. And although not formally declared in the form of a solemn definition, many recent popes, when I say recent, I mean pre-Vatican II, have taught in a binding and 
authoritative manner what theologians have been teaching for centuries, that Mary is the mediatrix of all graces. And they have also taught the idea of her being the co-redemptrix. And this last title, that of co-redemptrix, is not a title that we often hear from the pulpit or read about in an article. And I think for two reasons. One, there is often a fear of being misunderstood and giving the wrong impression of what this doctrine really means. And second, it is not necessarily the easiest doctrine to explain, hence the reluctance. But I wanted to briefly explain it as simply as I can because it's important. Pope Benedict XV wrote in 1920, quote, With her suffering and dying son, Mary suffered almost to the point of death. She renounced her maternal rights over him, and for the purpose of appeasing divine justice, inasmuch as it was dependent upon her, she offered up her son so that it can be truly said of her that with her son she ransomed mankind. So clearly, according to Pope Benedict XV, Our Lady was not merely an idle spectator, but took an active role in the offering of the atonement for the sins of mankind. What the Eternal Father accepted was a joint offering made by the new Adam and through him and with him and in him and subordinate to him also offered by the new Eve. That in some mysterious way, we owe our redemption to her as well, subordinate to Christ and in complete dependence upon him but really and truly. And this is why she has been called the co-redemptrix. Admittedly, this title is at first misleading and perhaps a little shocking, but by it we are no way putting her on equal level with Jesus Christ, who is the Redeemer, whose passion and death adequately atone for the sins of all men, meriting all grace and giving us the possibility of attaining the beatific vision in heaven. We don't have two Redeemers, only one redeemer, only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. Our Lady was redeemed by Christ's sacrifice, and any grace that she ever received or was going to receive was due to her son's sacrifice. But our Lord has willed to have the members of his mystical body associate themselves and assist them in the great work of redemption. He doesn't need apostles but he chooses to have them. He doesn't need anyone to sanctify souls by administering the sacraments, but he chooses to have them. He doesn't need any of us to pray for sinners, but he wants us to. He doesn't need the angels, but he uses them. He chooses to make use of subordinate mediators to a system. And this teaches us one very important truth in the spiritual life that each of us, that each of Christ's mystical members are called to be other Christs, other redeemers, other saviors in their own way and in their own degree for the salvation of the world. We are all to unite our prayers and sufferings with our Lord's great sacrifice. That is what we do at Mass. That's why we have daily Mass. The sacrifice of the head is perfect, but there are still things wanting to his sacrifice in his mystical body that we have to fill up. St. Paul said, I fill up those things that are wanting of the suffering of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now these merits that the mystical members offer or obtain and these acts are not saving and strict justice. They're only so by divine complacence because our Lord wills to consider the multiple contributions of each of his members and to use them for the salvation of souls. So co-redemptrix, when applied to Our Lady, simply means that she cooperated with Christ in the work of human redemption, in, but in a most unique and exemplary way. Our Lady is the perfect member of the mystical body. She is the supreme Christian. And she united herself to his sacrifice so perfectly 
and by her most perfect union with our Lord, she merited by her co-suffering, by her prayers, by her great love, all the graces that were ever to be distributed till the end of time. I will come back to that thought. In 1904, Pope St. Pius X taught in his encyclical Ad Deum Elum, quote, because she surpassed all others in holiness and in closeness to Christ, and because she was chosen by him to be his associate in the work of saving mankind, Mary merits for us congruently, as is said, what Christ merited condignly, unquote. And when St. Pius X says, as is said, he's making reference to the common teaching of theologians and giving his approval of their teaching and explanation. And theologians use two terms in order to distinguish two types of merit. There is merit de condigno, condign merit, and that is merit in strict justice. And then there is merit de congruo, congruent merit. It's merit, but it's not in strict justice, but on friendship. That the recipient doesn't deserve it, but it's because you're a friend of God. that God will give it to you. And merit in general means a right to a reward. Merit doesn't produce that reward, but it gives you a right to it. And supernatural merit is a right to a supernatural reward. So to make this as simple as possible, condign merit is merit that you can only earn for yourself. De congruo merit is merit you earn for others. And only Christ was able to perfectly merit condignly for us because he is the head because he alone is constituted the head of humanity the new Adam the second Adam that he was in our place he stood for us and that when he sacrifices that he deserves out of perfect and strict justice God owes him those merits and graces that even the slightest drop of blood from our Lord, the slightest breath, the slightest heartbeat, because he is a divine person, was worthy of to save a billion worlds in strict justice. So basically the difference between Christ's merits and Our Lady's is that his merits make demands on the Father's grace and mercy and, and strict justice, whereas her merits make supplication to God for these graces. They're simply petitions in words or actions, but eminently powerful petitions that have been infallibly heard, obtaining for us every grace. But the key point is this. Every grace that Christ merited for us in strict justice, Our Lady obtained all of that because she is the perfect friend of God. That our lady, our Lord merited this huge, we can picture an analogy, a huge mountain of grace, of gold, for example, and gave it all to our lady because of her suffering and her prayer. All of it. At the cross and through this sacrifice of our our Lord. She was, spiritually speaking, giving supernatural birth and great pain to her mystical children. All the sufferings that Jesus suffered in his passion, his mother suffered in her heart and soul. It was her Dolores' compassion, her co-passion. Every grace that is given to us, we owe not only to her intercession, but to her suffering, to her compassion with her son, her co-suffering. Our Lady gave birth to Christ without pain, but suffered enormously, giving supernatural birth to the members of his mystical body. Pope Leo XIII says, quote, The Most Holy Virgin, Mother of Jesus Christ, is also Mother of Christians, for she has given birth to them on Mount Calvary amidst the extreme sufferings of her Son, our Redeemer. Jesus, then, is, as it were, the firstborn of Christians, 
who by the adoption and redemption are become his brethren, unquote. And Pope Pius XI said in 1935 in the Lusservatore Romano, quote, O mother of love and mercy, thou who, as co-redemptress, was filled with compassion as thou stoodst at the side of thy most dearly beloved son, when on the altar of the cross he wrought the redemption of mankind, conserve and increase in us each day the precious fruits of the redemption and of thy compassion, unquote. And just before he was about to die, our Lord chose that moment to announce by solemn declaration Mary's spiritual maternity of men. When Jesus therefore had said, had seen his mother and his disciple standing, whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. After that, he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And using the word woman, it's very significant. Our Lord is linking that sacrifice of Calvary with what God said to the serpent in the Garden of Eden. I shall put enmities between thee and the woman. And notice how scripture says, and he said to the disciple, not by the particular name John, but by the anonymous word disciple, because that's us. It's all of us. It's the church, the mystical body. Behold your mother. And I think Catholics generally do not fully understand this aspect of Our Lady's role in redemption. Most people think it is simply that we pray to her and she hears our prayers and she asks God for us. She intercedes with, for us much in the same way any saint would. And she does that, of course, but it's, it goes further. Whatever grace God wills for us to have... She has actually earned that grace for us. We owe everything to her under Christ. She is literally, not merely poetically or metaphorically, the mother of your interior life, the life of grace in your soul. At each moment, she is essential to you. We can do nothing supernatural without grace, Nothing that gets us any closer to sanctity or salvation without grace. <coughs> and it is through her that every grace comes to us. We cannot, therefore, at any moment be without her motherly care. And we're not just spiritual children, but we're her spiritually infants. And it would actually be closer to say that we are in her womb mystically speaking, and she is forming Christ within us until our heavenly birthday. Just think of what all this means. Every single grace you have ever received or will ever receive in your life came not only through her, but because of her. That she merited the grace of your baptism. Every sacramental grace you've ever received in your life, she merited that for you. Every time you've performed any meritorious action, every movement towards prayer, every time you repented from sin, every time you've increased in sanctifying grace, she earned that for you from her son. That grace came to you because of her, and that is primarily her triumph the triumph of her immaculate heart and sorrowful heart. Every soul in this state of grace is her triumph. Every sinner converting to God is her triumph. Every soul in purgatory and every soul in heaven is her triumph, a triumph of her immaculate heart. And remember that her immaculate heart is not something other than herself. It's not some entity apart from her. Just as the sacred heart is not other than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. His physical heart is, which we worship, is hypostatically united to a divine person. But we use the heart. He showed us his heart because it's the natural symbol of his unfathomable love for his Father and for us sinners. But it represents all of him, the very depth of his being and personality. And so her immaculate heart is the symbol of her holy and spotless heart 
which loved God and loved us more than words can ever describe. A heart full of love, but is rarely loved in return. A heart all on fire and yet wounded by ingratitude and sin. The perfect mother's heart for us. And if we want to talk about the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we really have to start with these truths. And just let that truth sink into your heart. Every grace that has ever come to you and will ever come to you, every increase of love of God that stirs in your heart and soul, she earned that for you. And if you cooperate with divine grace and eventually die in the state of grace and save your immortal soul, that was her triumph. Now the triumphs of Mary's Immaculate Heart has not been confined to the secret interior life of the soul. She has interceded many times in the external history of the world and the Catholic Church in so many ways. Some of these intercessions were localized. They're meant for a, a specific need of that time or place or nation or village. And then some of these intercessions, although local, were meant to be propagated throughout the world. They're meant to influence the whole world. And all of these miraculous interventions show that Our Lady is attentive to our supplications in the history of, and, and is always looking down upon us with a true and loving mat, uh, maternal care. One cannot get more influential in the history of the world than Our Lady. Only God himself, including, of course, the incarnate word, can be more influential because God not only concurs with every supernatural event inside or outside our souls, but with every natural movement as well. Every particle of dust that stirs, every atom needs his intimate and immediate simultaneous action in order to exist. Other than this omnipotence, this omnipresence of God, and the omnipotent power of God, Our Lady is the most influential being this world has ever seen. Her touch is everywhere. Our Lady's triumphs and influence over the church begins right at the beginning of the church. When Our Lord ascends into heaven, Mary is shown in Scripture as being close to the apostles and uniting, united with them in prayer, preparing for Pentecost. And one of her first triumphs in the history of the church is giving a stability and a strong foundation to the apostles. After Our Lady's assumption into heaven, which was a triumph as well, church history does not mention Our Lady overly much in the first centuries, and that was important as well. We have to understand that the primary doctrine that needed to be propagated at the beginning was not the doctrine concerning Our Lady or of St. Joseph or anything else, but primarily the doctrine that needed to be propagated at the beginning was of who and what our Lord is. He is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the Redeemer. He's the incarnate Word. He's the second person of the Holy Trinity. In the fifth century, however, it was precisely concerning Our Lady, doctrine concerning Our Lady, which protected and clarified the Catholic doctrine concerning Christ, <coughs> that he is one divine person, not two. He's the second person of the Holy Trinity. The heresiarch Nestorius denied this. He made Christ into two persons, one human and one divine. And he said Mary was the mother of the human person. And then the divine person came to dwell. And all the Catholics of the time, or at least of his town, they had a deep devotion to Our Lady, and they hailed her as the mother of God, because she is the mother of a divine person. Not merely a, a holy human person, but a divine person. And... Nestorius was condemned at the Council of Ephesus in 431. So Our Lady triumph over heresy, <coughs> which he was to do over and over. 
And for this reason, in the Roman Missal, she is called the destroyer of heresies. And she's already conquered the heresy. She's already crushed the head of the serpent and his seed, and one of his seeds is heresy. In the Middle Ages, Our Lady became, became quite active. Many saints rose up, filled with the love of, for God's mother and our spiritual mother, and spread greater devotion to her. St. Bernard, being one of the greatest Marian doctors and last of the fathers of the church. In all truth, Benedictines or black Benedictines are not particularly known as a Marian order. Of course, all Benedictines prayed to Our Lady and sang hymns to her and had devotion to her, theological devotion, but did not push devotion to her in an extraordinary manner. The branch of Benedictines called the Cistercians really became a Marian monastic order because of the influence of St. Bernard, and practically every Cistercian abbey was named after Our Lady. And the two other major <clears throat> orders of the Middle Ages, which were especially known as devoted to Our Lady and did so much good for souls, are the Carmelites and the Dominicans. And these two orders spread devotion to Mary far and wide. And because of it, so many souls were kept from heresy. So many souls were saved. So Mary conquered and triumphed over the Middle Ages through these orders. And two of the great sources of grace, outside of the sacraments, of course, for us poor sinners, have been the two Marian devotional practices, the sacramentals, the scapular and the rosary. And the scapular, as we know, was committed to St. Simon Stock and the Carmelites. And the rosary was spread far and wide by St. Dominic and his Dominicans. And it's believed that early in the 13th century, St. Dominic entered a chapel of Our Lady of, at Languedoc, France. And he cast himself on his knees, begging Our Lady with all his heart to put an end to the Albigensian heresy. And Mary appeared to him in all her glory and said, Take, O Dominic, this my rosary, made as it were of so many roses, and accompanied by such prayers as are continually heard with so much joy in heaven. Go and preach everywhere this new form of prayer, which I bring down from heaven, and you will find that as it is most beautiful, it is most pleasing to my heart, most profitable to those who make use of it, most efficacious in rooting out heresy, in overcoming vice, in promoting virtue, and in obtaining graces of every kind from God. And the Albigensian heresy was destroyed. Our Lady again interceded to destroy a heresy that would have meant the destruction of Christian society if left to spread its errors. And then we have the scapular and St. Simon's stock. On July 16, 1251, the Blessed Virgin Mary came down from heaven, surrounded by a great light, bringing the brown scapular. And from that day, untold multitude of Catholics wear her scapular with great devotion and it's been a source of untold blessings upon the world. So the rosary and the scapular are the two pillars of devotion to Our Lady and through them Our Lady has triumphed over and over. I believe it was yesterday that Father and I have made reference to the prophecy of the rosary and the scapular. It's believed that St. Dominic himself prophesied, I believe he was at Rome at the time, in presence of St. Francis of Assisi and another Carmelite friar. And he said to them, One day, Brother Angelus, to your order of Carmel, the Most Blessed Virgin Mary will give a devotion to be known as the Brown Scapular. And to my order of preachers, she will give a devotion to be known as the rosary. And one day, through the rosary and the scapular, she will save the world. <coughs> one of her greatest triumphs was in Mexico. Under the title of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I will not go into the details of this great intervention. But we know that Our Lady appeared to Juan Diego 
<clears throat> and impressed a miraculous image of herself on his cloak, the tilma. <clears throat> and in eight years, there were approximately nine million converts. Those are the numbers I've read. A whole nation conquered to Christ by Our Lady, the Immaculate One. And when Europe was in the throes of heresy and apostasy from the Catholic Church by the Protestant Reformation, so many souls separated from the true Church of Christ. And Our Lady made up for those losses by conquering a whole nation for Catholicism. Another great triumph of Our Lady was in the great Battle of Lepanto in 1571, where the battleships of Spain and Venice defeated the invasion of the Muslim Turks. And Pope St. Pius V, reigning at the time, ordered all the monasteries and convents in Rome to pray the rosary for the defeat of the enemies of Christendom. And the Archbishop of Mexico sent a copy of the holy image of Guadalupe to King Philip II, who in turn gave it to one of the three jet admirals of the fleet. And as the Catholic fleet sailed toward the enemy, mass was celebrated and the rosary recited every day on each vessel. And after the victory, St. Pius V designated October the 7th as the Feast of Our Lady of Victory. And he added Mary, help of Christians to the litany of Our Lady. Pope Gregory the Thirteenth later changed the name of the feast on October 7th to the Feast of the Holy Rosary. But clearly, these two titles are linked. Our Lady of Victory through the Rosary. And the victory of the Battle of Lepanto saved the Christian West. Similarly, the Blessed Virgin Mary is acknowledged as interceding through the recitation of the Rosary and the victory over the Turks by John Sobieski in the Siege of Vienna in 1683, and also after the victory of Prince Eugene of Savoy in his successful battles against the Ottoman Turks. Next we have Our Lady's apparition in 1830 to St. Catherine Labore in Paris. And in this apparition, Our Lady ordered a medal to be made, which is known as the Medal of the Immaculate Conception, or more popularly known as the Miraculous Medal. And so many miracles of healing and conversion resulted. And this was a prelude to the definition of the great dogma of the Immaculate Conception by Pope Pius IX in 1854. And then we have the well-known story of St. Bernadette and Our Lady's apparition at Lourdes, France. In this apparition, Our Lady called herself, I am the Immaculate Conception, confirming the Catholic dogma. And Our Lady made a miraculous spring appear, which has been the cause of so many thousands of miraculous cures and conversions. And then we have, in 1917, the great apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima, Portugal. Again, there's no need for me to go into the details of this apparition. But suffice it to say that this apparition of Our Lady and her words are the most important for us in these days. And you look at the miracle of the sun witnessed by 70,000 people, including atheists and agnostics, is certainly a sign of Our Lady's power and that she is able, she is capable of practically anything. If she is able to throw the sun around like a trinket at her wrist, then what is she not able to do? And now we come to our own time. Is Our Lady still triumphing? Do we see signs of her activity in the church? The obvious answer is absolutely. She is still with us and still triumphing. Small, perhaps. Mostly hidden, definitely but very significantly. At Fatima, Our Lady wanted the third secret to be revealed in 1960, as it would, she said, be more clear at that time. But she obviously knew that it would not be read. I'm sure God revealed that to her. Just because she wanted it revealed doesn't mean that she didn't know that what would happen. 
And I think it's very significant that she chose 1916. <clears throat> As that was the beginning of the real revolution in the church. Maybe not the beginning of the beginning. We could go back to Garden of Eden for the beginning. But John the 23rd had just called the terrible Vatican Council II. That ushered in, as we know, all the heresies of false ecumenism, false religious liberty, and all the rest, eventually leading to the new Protestantized mass and sacraments. Millions have lost their faith because of Vatican II. It was a divine chastisement. It is perhaps the greatest chastisement the church has ever seen or will ever see. <clears throat> and I think Our Lady chose 1960 to strengthen the faith of the remnant faithful Catholics who rejected these changes, us. And it's not coincidence. I think ever since the beginning of the traditional movement, as it has been incorrectly termed, incorrect because we haven't moved anywhere, we're simply Catholic, but ever since the beginning of the traditional movement it has largely been Marian in spirit, largely inspired by Our Lady of Fatima, devotion to the Immaculate Heart, devotion to the scapular and the Holy Rosary. And I say this not just of the CMRI, but in general. Even amongst the more conservative Novus Ordo groups who have not made that necessary break with Vatican II yet, devotion to Our Lady is very central. And that's very significant. Almost instinctively, every traditional Catholic knows that the third secret of Fatima, what it really was about, even without even seeing it. And we all laugh at the so-called third secret that the Vatican released. Everyone knows that Our Lady was foretelling the crisis in the church, the great apostasy, that we live in, are living through today, and that the apostasy would go all the way to the top, affecting the papacy. Now, this is not the reason why we're set of a contest. Our position as set of a contest, or most of us here, it's not based on this speculation or on any private revelation <coughs> or apparition, but on solid theological grounds. Yet it does give us a little extra strength knowing that Our Lady of Fatima is still intimately linked to our times. We traditional Catholics would not be here if it were not for Our Lady. The mere fact that we have the grace to see the truth of what happened in the church and the strength to resist the changes of the modernist infiltrators <coughs> is a grace that we owe to our spiritual mother. And considering all the difficulties and trials and scandals and debates and arguments and disagreements of all kinds, it is amazing that we traditional Catholics still exist and they're growing. For all the opposition inside and outside that we receive without having the <clears throat> leadership and guidance of a true pontiff and hierarchy, it is amazing how strong our faith is. It's amazing how much unity we do have. And I think sometimes our disunity is exaggerated in certain respects. There are disagreements, definitely, amongst different traditional groups in the practical application of principles in these confusing times. I think that's to be expected. But we have the same faith and the same essentials in practice. We all agree that we must reject Vatican II and the new Mass. <coughs> but it is amazing how much apparent structure and normality we have retained. And some of it is apparent. And we shouldn't fool ourselves. We are in the catacombs. We are not in the 1950s. We are not in normal times. And I don't think we're ever going to fully restore what the church was before Vatican II and all its externals and cultural influence, not for centuries. We will be lucky to be able to keep offering mass in church buildings 
instead of in the woods and in caves. Humanly speaking, we shouldn't be here. I have no doubt, and you shouldn't have any doubt, that you are here because of a special grace obtained for you from Our Lady. And miraculously, day by day, day after day, new people are still finding the truth and finding a traditional Latin mass center. <coughs> and each of their stories is a tale of grace. And almost always, it is because the individual was praying the rosary or had some devotion to Our Lady, almost without fail. And in a similar way, it, it, it's miraculous today, really. All the times we're able to build or purchase new churches and schools. A good example is the recent acquisition of the church in Rosamond, California. The church dedicated to and called the Immaculate Heart of Mary Church. And as a priest, I am relatively young and new as a pastor. And I'm sure that all the other priests here that, and that the priest that I'm working with under Bishop Hevrunas, most especially the bishop himself, must have so many stories of conversions and almost miraculous events that Our Lady was involved in. Of course, she is involved everywhere because wherever grace is working, the mediatrix of all graces, the queen of heaven and earth, must be working. So in general... The traditional movement, I think, it has been a Marian movement based on theological grounds, but inspired by devotion to her. And I think overall, as we traditional Catholics <clears throat> are far more devoted to her on average, I think, than even the Catholics before Vatican II. Daily recitation of the rosary, wearing the brown scapular, the five first Saturdays, St. Louis de Montfort's true consecration of Mary, devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Our Lady of Fatima. These are meat and potatoes for traditional Catholics. They're staples. And all of us, even those who are not ostensibly Marian in our devotion, all of us desire to go to Jesus through Mary. It's in our blood now. And it's not surprising, many of saints have said, we are in the age of Mary. So I think in the history of the church, she has never been more active than she is right now. She's still watching over us. On July 13th, 1917, Our Lady appeared for the third time to the children of Fatima, and she said to them, You have seen hell, where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved, and there will be peace. The war is going to end. If people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. When you see a knight illumined by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given you by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the Church and of the Holy Father. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and for the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted, and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. We know that people did not cease to offend God, and there came upon a world, upon the world a worse war, World War II. The communion of reparation of the first Saturday, Saturdays obviously was not observed sufficiently, yet at least. And I don't think Russia has been consecrated explicitly by a true pope in union with the bishops of the world. And therefore, Russia has spread her errors of communism, materialism, atheism throughout the world. And as said of a contest, we don't think John Paul II was a true pope, and his consecration had no power. So in any case, has Russia converted? 
Not really. Communism in Russia has apparently fallen, but I don't think a mere change of political system is what Our Lady meant by Russia will be converted. They're not Catholic. They don't have the true faith yet. Some traditional Catholics might debate some of these points, but I don't see how. One thing Our Lady did say that should give us tremendous hope and comfort, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. It will triumph. And what is this triumph? One part of it is that Russia will be converted as a sign of her triumph, and there will be peace. But she assures us that this will happen. But what must precede this? The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me. It implies that there will be a Pope who will consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, explicitly. And in union with the bishops of the world, even if the number of those bishops be reduced to a mere handful, which we have today. So a true Pope will do this consecration in the way Our Lady requested, and the result will follow, and it will be triumphant. Our Lord told Sister Lucy that it will be done, but it will be late. I don't think it's happened yet, but I think it will. I believe that we will get a true Pope, and I think that one of the great miracles that, it's my opinion, that one of the great miracles that we will witness relatively soon is Our Lady will somehow give us a true Pope. A Pope is the Vicar of Christ, her son on earth, and who better to give us this miracle than the mother of Christ? And so many of the real problems in the traditional Catholic world would be solved almost overnight if only we had a true Pope. And humanly speaking, we are in an impossible crisis. And there doesn't seem to be any clear way to fix the mess, no clear way to even get a true Pope again. And I have no idea how Our Lady will do this or how she will convert Russia. But if she can make the sun dance for 70,000 witnesses, imagine if she did the same thing for 70 million or 7 billion. She could do it. Also, it's significant that she chose to appear in Fatima, which happened to be the name of Muhammad's daughter, and the Muslims do consider Mary very highly. So will she convert the Muslims as well on a large scale? In the Apocalypse it reads, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, <coughs> and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Maybe St. John meant literally, the world will see this. Maybe not. But whatever she will do, it will be absolutely clear and decisive and effective. There are many opinions on these matters. These are simply mine. I believe that Bishop Pivrunas is of the opinion that Our Lady's triumph is primarily the fact that we traditional Catholics are still, in fact, here. It's a miracle of grace. Also, and I may be mistaken, but I think the bishop also postulated the idea that the prophecies of Fatima were largely conditional and that we may be simply in a post-Fatima era. There's definitely an argument could be made. It has similarities to our Lord wanting France consecrated. It wasn't done to his sacred heart, and France lost the, 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 the kingship, the royalty. I have to say that I totally and absolutely agree with the bishop. I have to say this or he'll take me hunting. <laughs> something about an unfortunate accent or something. <laughs> Kidding. But it is true there's many opinions and there's lots of speculation about what Our Lady meant regarding her triumph <clears throat> and how things will precisely play out and I have my opinion, and you may have yours. As long as we stay within the confines of solid theology, I think all is good. But one thing for certain, we'll find out the truth. What we need most 
of all in these terrible days of confusion, apostasy, and crisis in the church is hope. In the Salve Regina, the prayer, Hail Holy Queen, we call Mary our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Our hope. Hope is a very practical virtue, but one that is often misunderstood. And don't worry, I will finish soon. I don't want to put some of you to sleep or to wake up the other ones who are sleeping. But when we hope in God, we have the theological virtue of hope. We're not to put some hope in God and some in our own goodness and virtue. We're supposed to put all our hope in the goodness of God and his power and his fidelity to his promises. Without me, you can do nothing, our Lord said. And this is a truth that we heard early on in our lives, but it sometimes takes a whole lifetime to truly learn it. And we learn it through suffering, humiliation, failure, the consciousness of our own weakness and limitations and nothingness. Most of the trials in the spiritual life, all the aridities and temptations and dark night of the senses and dark night of the spirit, most of these trials are simply the necessary purifications of the virtue of hope. All self-righteousness, self-reliance, all pride must be crushed. And I'm afraid we traditional Catholics need a little bit more purification. More humility. And perhaps humiliation in order to be open to grace. We can be quite proud and self-righteous. We have received a great grace. We are no better of ourselves than others who have not received this grace. And often we're much worse than others. Or could be much worse than others without God's grace. God often picks the bottom of the barrel to confound the wise and the powerful of the world. But that scum on the bottom shouldn't think itself the cream of the crop. So the best preparation for being worthy is to admit that you are not worthy. Lord, I am not worthy, you repeat before receiving Holy Communion. I am nothing, and you are nothing. And we have to humble ourselves. We have to realize that God does not love us because we're good. We're good because God loves us. He has given us a grace. St. Augustine said that. We have to admit that we're nothing and that anything good in us is from God through Our Lady. And if there will be any restoration of the church, it will be primarily a spiritual restoration. It will come through the humble handmaid of Nazareth. She has said at Fatima, only I can save you. So let us not think. We have to do good actions. We have to do good works. We have to try to spread the apostolate. But one more article, one more talk is not going to save the world. We have to get on our knees and say, I can't do it. I can't do it without you. Our Lord has put our fate in the hands of his blessed mother and our spiritual mother. And I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Our mother does. She is the queen of the universe, the queen of heaven and earth. My dear people, Our Lady has triumphed. She is triumphing, and she will triumph. God bless you. <laughs>